Well, hey there, folks. Mr. Bleeker here. Uh, moving on to topic 19.3, diseases caused by bacteria and viruses. And this chapter in your book is actually quite interesting. It goes even further. It looks at some of the things that can cause disease that are caused by something outside of these cells we know as bacteria and these renegade little protein bags with genetic material inside of them that we call viruses and it goes into something called prions. I found that fascinating that they would go that far. Uh, we'll venture into that realm a little bit. Have some great animations for you today so let's get started. Alrighty. So what you're looking at, what you're looking at here um, is of course a virus. Nice little dandy and it's set up to kind of look like you're looking through something like an electron microscope with some visual enhancements. We'll get going. There's lots of great stuff. When we look at bacteria and viruses, they cause disease. And you say, well, hold on for a second. What exactly is a disease? Like, really, what, what constitutes that? Well, a disease has a fairly simple definition. It's probably, you'll hear different ones, but one of the better definitions of a disease is anything that causes tissue impairment. Or you can think of it as affecting tissue in a negative way. Now that seems like a very broad definition, but when we consider disease, it can be caused in so many different ways. Um, in this case, right here, they refer to um, pathogens. Now that's that's fine and dandy to say that disease-causing agents are pathogens. When you say pathogens, you generally think of little critters that make us sick. You eat a hamburger where the meat isn't quite cooked properly. Or you drank some water and it had some viral contamination. Or maybe you just inhaled um, influenza in an aerial form, unfortunately, when you were wandering down the hallway, somebody sneezed and the little droplets are floating in the air. You can't see them and you inhale them. But if a disease is anything that causes tissue impairment, you have to understand that our bodies have a have an unfortunately nasty habit of attacking themselves. So there are these diseases, and this comes up later, called autoimmune diseases, where our immune system unfortunately kind of goes on autopilot and makes some mistakes and attacks itself. And I want to really get that out of the way before we get much further. Some diseases that our bodies can cause in ourselves are things, well, for example, in this case, we're looking at some of our insulin producing cells. And our bodies can overreact and can attack these things. So what you're seeing on the right in sort of in the darkened region is where our insulin producing cells in our pancreas can be attacked by our own immune systems and no longer work. And if we no longer produce insulin, then we can't get sugar out of our blood very effectively. And that, that's, that's a type of diabetes. Another dandy, unfortunately, would be something like arthritis, where our bodies literally attack our joints and they can disfigure them. Arthro meaning joints and itis meaning inflammation of. And I like this picture because it shows so many joints that can be attacked. So this again is, is tissue impairment where your cartilage is literally being nibbled away by your own immune system. And previously, our own immune system can nibble away at these specialized little cells that produce insulin. So disease is a tissue impairment. So let's be really clear with that nice general definition. Getting to the things that cause disease, we can say, well, there's bacterial, there's autoimmune diseases like arthritis, um, there are viral diseases. Heck, you can go out further. There are diseases caused by fungi, uh, athlete's foot. There's a great little one for you. You can look at diseases caused by single-celled advanced little critters we know as protists. Yes, even something like a paramecium can make you sick. So. Here's a hint, don't drink unfiltered or untreated water. 
Okay, if you've ever gone tree planting, you would have learned that one pretty quick. When we talk about disease causing, though, let's change our color because I get so tired of yellow. What we're talking about are our pathogenic critters. And what they do is they, they disrupt the body's equilibrium. Now, what that really means is if you get sick, um, it's going to mess with your system. And one of the quickest ways I can think of is a fever. So normally our bodies are around 97 to 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's sort of a, a happy little range there. And um, if you get sick, you can get a fever and your temperature can, can range much higher. You can hit temperatures of 102 degrees Fahrenheit or, or higher. Fahrenheit turns out to be a really useful temperature scale because the units in it are so fine that you can see really small changes in body temperature. Celsius, not so good. When my kids get sick, I go running for a Fahrenheit thermometer. Right, Much, much better to detect small changes. You can get a fever. Uh, unfortunately, if you've ever, well, if you've gone out tree planting and you, you got really thirsty and you drank water out of a stagnant pool, you could have got what they call beaver fever caused by a little critter named Giardia. And that could throw your, your equilibrium out of rack, out of, out of whack, uh, giving you um, diarrhea. Oops, ha! Huh, it's a race set. Diarrhea is one of those horrible words, and I apologize for the spelling of it. Uh, I think I misspelled that, but I'll put a winky phrase, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you'll forgive me. So diarrhea, uh, vomiting. Okay, I don't think I need to show you a picture of that. But if you've ever consumed, say, uncooked hamburger meat yeah, or and suffered through something like food poisoning, four hours after you eat it, about that point, it's either the bacteria themselves or the toxins that the bacteria have produced, sort of like toxic little poop, that'll have you vomiting, uh, unfortunately, kind of from both ends, not to really freak you out, but that's not far off. So how do bacteria cause disease? Well, this is interesting because you have to consider that when you cook food, the bacteria themselves can make you sick. There are bacteria that can cause uh, flesh-eating disease. They can produce an enzyme. They can produce toxins, which are little chemicals that they release that can severely affect your systems. Um, when you look at gangrene, that one comes up. Enzymes are like little uh, proteins that can digest and destroy. Unfortunately, with flesh-eating disease, that happens. Um, not really interested in showing you pictures of that. I'll let you check that out on your own. Um, but take care in Google. If you type flesh-eating disease, you're going to get uh, quite a shocking picture. They cause disease by creating tissue impairment or tissue damage. And they upset our systems to the point where uh, it's very difficult for us to recover. And it's not just humans. It's not just uh, animals in general. Everything can really get a disease. Even bacteria can be attacked themselves. But we're talking about bacterial disease here. So let's, let's roll a little further with this. Really what you're talking about is damage. Damage to the cells or tissues. And that is caused by them being broken down. Bacteria will use you as a food source. So let's take that a little further. Bacteria will use you as a food source, which is, of course, unfortunate. Or there are their toxins, and that's dead on, poisons, which travel through the body. Now, if you make spaghetti and you leave it on the stove and you leave it too long, okay, so let's say you leave spaghetti on the stove for a day. Okay, you're, you're sort of taking your chances. The bacteria that are nearby will sort of recolonize the area. Even some bacteria that weren't fully cooked, like E. coli, which you find in hamburger meat, they can start to grow back in the food. Now, just because you throw it in the freezer, right, doesn't mean that you've necessarily killed them. You might have slowed them down or put them in suspended animation. You re um, you thaw, <laughs> you thaw that material, put it on the stove. You can't do this endless thawing pattern over and over again because sooner or later they will release toxins okay they're going to release these 
And even if the bacteria are taken care of, you can microwave it as much as you want. Once those toxins are in that food, you're going to get sick. And there are some of these toxins in, at high enough levels can not only make you sick, but they can kill you. Like you can die from things like dehydration. You can die from excessive vomiting and diarrhea. If you've ever heard of cholera, for example, unfortunately that was happening to the Haitian people uh, after the earthquake. Once there's an outbreak of cholera, uh, and unfortunately people are losing severe amounts of water, the body just can't handle that. It throws the equilibrium out so bad that that causes death by dehydration. So those toxins in that food, you got to realize, once those toxins are released, they're there. And even if you kill the bacteria, their toxins are still prevalent. So you can't reheat food endlessly. My advice, well, reheat it as little as possible. If I make a spaghetti dinner, I'll throw it in the freezer, but then I'll only reheat what I want, and I'll only reheat it one time. That is a safe bet. So there, there's several diseases you can look at here. Um, Lyme disease with its characteristic bullseye rash. Tetanus, tetanus is a nasty one. If you've ever stepped on a rusty nail, you would have probably been running to the physician to get, and I know I did this, I cut my hand open with a rusty pair of scissors. My parents will never let me live it down. It was my fault. I had a mood ring. I was a little kid. I thought they were fascinating, but the mood ring that I bought from a store had a little piece of tape on it, and I decided to carve away at it. I was pretty young with a pair of scissors, and I cut my hand wide open, and I realized that the pair of scissors, when I was looking down into my hand, which was cut open, was pretty freaky for a small child to look into his hand, and it was all cut open. I'd used a pair of scissors that had been used to, uh, unfortunately, on a cattle ranch, um, cut some cattle stitches. And as soon as I showed my father my, my cut open hand, he said, okay, well, we're, we're going to go back over the border from Washington to Canada, of course, Canadian citizen, and, and you have to get stitched up. And then the first thing the doctor gave me was a, uh, he gave me, oh, let's use a slightly darker color. He gave me what's called the DPT shot. And one of the important aspects of that, that vaccine, um, one of the aspects is it, it helps to protect you or immunize you in a hurry from tetanus because tetanus is a um, an anaerobic bacterium and it, it hides in rust things like that and this was an old pair of scissors and if you've ever stepped on a rusty nail or used a rusty pair of scissors what could have happened and you have to avoid this at all costs is the bacterium itself produces some toxins where uh, you get muscle spasms it gets pretty bad to the point where um, your muscles can literally lock up on you and it can be fatal so severe muscle spasms elevated blood pressure lockjaw tetanus itself means that there's a rigor your muscles just tighten up and tetanus is, is a horrible condition because if that tightening of the muscles happens if it happens to your diaphragm and interferes with your ability to breathe or interferes with your the beating of your heart, you'll die. Okay? Tuberculosis, I'm going to show you an animation of that one in a moment. That's a severe lung infection caused by a little bacterium known as Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Meningitis. Now, that's a nasty one, which I will show a picture of in a second. Needless to say, that's when bacteria get into your central nervous system that is into your spinal column and into your brain, they're not supposed to make it in there. Your brain and spinal cord are triple ply wrapped to keep everything, including viruses, etc., out of the way. There's three, what we call meninges, three wraps, um, dura mater, pyometer, and arachnoid. And really, that's pretty tough to get through. If the bacteria do get in there, there's not many immune cells to stop them. Strep throat is another nasty one. Uh, if you've ever had strep throat, they're long sort of chains of cock, um, round spherical bacteria known as cocci. And you got to watch out for this one because strep throat, if those bacteria get through your tissues and into your blood, you can get uh, growths on your heart valves. And that's, that's very, very dangerous. So strep throat has to be taken seriously by physicians. Okay, I have to pop out of reflection for just a second because I got to now that I'm just doing a video I can show you is sort of in, I have a bit more time 
and I can show you about some ones like tuberculosis. Um, we'll look at strep throat. Uh, I have to talk about a spinal tap. So I'm going to jump around a little bit here to, to sort of elucidate these points. So we're going to pop out. Kind of neat. I When I record these, I jump between an iPad and sometimes my computer, depending what I need to do. So here we go. Uh, neat. You, you, you can look online and find some great animations. And I'm interested in... I uh, just had it up here a second ago. Uh, we're going to look at tuberculosis. There we go. That helps. And we'll look at a tuberculosis infection. Tuberculosis is a disease of the respiratory system. It's caused by an obligate anaerobe known as uh, genus Mycobacterium. And you can get it through airborne bacteria. You can get it uh, through infected saliva. You kind of get the idea. There have been spitting laws uh, long in place against tuberculosis because of the salivary transmission of this little bacterium. It's very nasty and it wants to infect your lungs. So what happens, neat little flash animation here, um, they've done a great job with this, is you get it into your respiratory system uh, let's say through inhalation. That's a that's a common way to do it. And these are very tough bacteria. They'll go down to the. We'll just pause that. They'll go down to the tippy regions of your, of your lungs. They'll get all the way down to those little that blue thing you're looking at there is called known as an alveolus. Um, it's where the oxygen gets exchanged, and they'll grow down there. And a war happens with your immune system. So those little things right there are your macrophages and your your T cells and your helper T's and they all come in and they start launching antibodies at these things and they try to destroy them right and a war goes on and there's casualties your immune cells show up you get a you get a tremendous amount of infection here and these bacteria will break out of your alveoli and they'll get into sort of the neighboring tissues so the war goes on and on and on and some of these bacteria, I'm going to pause here, can literally secrete a sort of a calcified dome over top of themselves and they can wall themselves off from your immune system. And if they do that, you get these what are called tubercules in your lungs and they're little calcium, almost like little eggshells. And they become very difficult, of course, for macrophages and other white blood cells to get in there and attack these little critters because they've got a physical barrier and they all multiply under there and if if you get these tubercules in your lungs what will happen uh, you can see them on an x-ray we'll just pop out to Google they'll show up on an x-ray because they're, they're calcified we'll go to images shouldn't be too hard to find and uh, here we go sort of an assisted image and you'll see them sort of strange haze showing up in the lungs, right? And if you know, if you see that, uh, doctor, physicians will look at this. I should say physicians. And, you know, you'll look for haze and you'll think maybe that's those cancer cells. But if you know the person is suffering from tuberculosis, if you've given them, there's a skin test you can give them. And if it's positive, um, you take, uh, you can obviously follow up with a chest x-ray. If you see this, you're starting to see this calcified tissue and when someone with tuberculosis, if they cough uh, violently enough, vigorously enough, um, those little calcified domes themselves can kind of rupture at the base and you'll get sort of a frothy um, exudate and it'll come up in the in a spit and then they'll cough up blood and it's, it's horrible, it's nasty. So you would go on an antibiotic regimen, I, I just have to say it, antibiotic regimen from hell to get rid of uh, these little germies. OK, you have to keep whacking at tuber mycobacterium tuberculosis with just about every antibiotic you can to try to get rid of it because they can lie dormant, they can hide, uh, they get in your lungs and it's just a, a brutal battle. And if you get infected and you're coughing, um, you're releasing them into the air. So this can be a pretty nasty thing. 
great animation. Um, spitting laws were put in place because of the tuberculosis transmission happening uh, due to uh, spitting. Go back to my history here. Oops, missed it. There we go. Alrighty. That's the one I wanted. Okay, so I, I think it's important to see some of the other ones. This is a great site. Um, I wanted to... Uh, look at syphilis. Uh, they didn't have it. Let's see if it's not there. Well, well okay, that's fine. Um, I'll show you HIV. It's another one of my favorites. Uh, specifically, the HIV life cycle. The human immunodeficiency virus, known as HIV, is a virus that uh, some, can have some pretty drastic consequences, obviously, for the human population. And if you've ever had a chance to study it, it attacks one cell, in particular which activates most of our cells uh, for an immune response. So if you get, if, if you are infected by the human immunodeficiency virus, it will essentially attack the one cell that mounts an immune response when you get sick. So it looks fairly complicated, but what's really happening is HIV finds its way in, and once it gets into your body, it will go in and there we go in typical virus fashion it inserts its genome now its genome is is kind of RNA it's a neat little trick that HIV can do here it can turn its RNA genome into a uh, DNA genome using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase it sort of reverse writes its genetic code into ours so there's some insider baseball here we talk about this a little bit more but at this point, I just sort of sped it up. Um, you get a DNA copy of, of its material. And of course, in typical virus fashion, it goes in and into our nucleus and takes over. And what you've seen is integration. So this is lysogeny. At a certain point, when the virus decides to express itself, it, it can reverse write its original genetic code, its RNA, it makes basically makes copies of its genetics code and then it puts a body around this material and creates little baby viruses. So there's copies that our cells are, are, are making sort of blindly and the virus takes over our protein, um, basically our little protein factories and recreates uh, its own uh, viral proteins so it's going to make it a new body for itself so we're kind of unfortunately like little sort of zombie factories for virus babies and we'll just sort of speed this up a little bit and what you're seeing is you get the creation of a new there it is you get the creation of a new virus so as it exits it takes a little bit of our cell membrane with its genetic code and off it goes and that is HIV going off to find more cells to infect the problem with this is when it, it turns off it turns off our immune system we can get sick from a cold uh, from if you get the flu it, it, it's just a tremendous problem because you have no sort of natural immunity or highly reduced natural immunity just about everything that comes along not good so it's another disease caused uh, there's there's quite a few here a neat little website um, the dengue virus, etc. But I wanted to show you two. I, th I thought those would be very important. So um, I'll post this website on Twitter. Uh, basically, it's a Google search, and um, it's just tremendous. Okay, so let's go back into reflection. And we'll sort of finish off the rest. There we go. Um, Actually, just before I go there, I did want to talk about meningitis, uh, these different diseases. I have the time now that we're online to talk about it. Meningitis, bacterial meningitis is different than viral meningitis. Bacterial meningitis, uh, it, they, if you suffer from this, if these bacteria get into past your meninges, the layers uh, that stand between your brain and your spinal 
column, which is just brain tissue, if they get in there, they'll have to do what's called a spinal tap. They'll check the spinal fluid, and if the spinal fluid is cloudy, then what you'll see is, um, here we go, we'll use this. What you'll see is, is a cloudy material come out, and if it is cloudy, then you've got you've got definite issues because in this space in here right you've got bacteria and they will feast on your nervous tissue so they have to go in between um, let's see if I can zoom in there we go they have to go in between um, your vertebrae usually through a disc and they've got to make a little puncture and they send this off to a lab to evaluate now if it's bacterial meningitis it's very serious it has to be taken care of because it's hard to get antibiotics in there right away to uh, start taking down the bacterial population. Viral, if it turned out that you sent it to the lab, it was clear and it turned out to be viral meningitis, it's, it's, that's, that's a less volatile one. You're more likely to survive. Bacterial meningitis, that's a big one. That's panic button there. And you got to get right on to that. Strep throat. Strep throat. Um, let me go back here. Strep throat. loaded here is you'll you'll get these little devils growing this streptococcal bacteria growing on you'll see them growing on your your tonsil tissue uh, your tonsils are right here by the way it's your uvula right that sticks down from there if you look at streptococcus bacteria we'll go back a little bit oh thank you google Streptococcus can cause uh, several diseases, several problems. When we're talking about streptococcal bacteria, they form these chains. Okay, this is different than staphylococci. This is, uh, we call these strep chains, and uh, what's happening is there's sort of long branches of these bacteria, and it's this variety that gives us strep throat. Okay. Pretty well covers most of what I wanted to look at. I think I did want to show you uh, Lyme disease. Uh, you get bit by, um, you're bit by, in it, sort of infected by a, a tick bites you. And Lyme disease, Lyme disease, as far as the rash goes, this is what gives that away if you're bit. There it is. Um, you get this sort of bullseye shaped rash, and you've been bit by a tick, and it, it has a little uh, bacterium in it. And this is sort of the primary site of infection, and it, this can be treated, but you've got to get in right away. You've got to see your physician. Okay, so we'll come back. Uh, got a nice little animation of dairy farmers for you when we get back to it. Okay. So quite a bit of background information there, but it's good stuff. And we're back. There's a lot of diseases. If you like this, um, you will love pre-med. That'll definitely be your thing. Okay, so on to the next slide. One of the things that we can do to back to to combat disease is you can get vaccines. And I showed a video in class on this. Oops, I didn't want that. I wanted the highlighter. There it is. So a vaccine um, is either weakened or killed pathogens okay so if it's weakened or killed that's actually like two separate varieties if it's weakened that's sort of like the polio virus which we've gone over you can weaken it let's switch to our pen tool here this we call an attenuated a-t-t-e-n-u-a-t-e-d and an attenuated virus, uh, that would be, for example, how the uh, your sort of annual flu virus is raised by seeding it in chicken eggs. So the virus has grown up on chicken eggs, and it's sort of repeatedly transferred and cultured, so that the virus thinks it's a, sort of attacking an avian host, and then it gets in our body and sort of looks around and says, well, this 
I'm not in Kansas anymore. Where the heck am I? This isn't a chicken. And our immune system ha is, has a little bit more time to come along and beat the daylights out of the virus. The virus really becomes a little bit ineffective. Sometimes you can get sick from a vaccine, but the attenuated viruses, that's live virus, right? It's weakened, but it's live. All right, so let's make a little note that it's live. If it's killed, that would be an example of, say, like the polio vaccine. You can't give someone, right? You can't give someone live polio vaccine. They'll get polio. You, you can't grow it up on chicken eggs and stick it into a person. That, that's not going to work. So what Jonas Salk discovered with polio was that he, he damaged it with formaldehyde and basically killed it. And as long as you inject that damaged body of the virus into us, it gives our immune system a chance to look it over and say, hey, I know what polio is, and the next time I see it, I'm going to beat the heck out of it. And that's a really smart way. Jonas Salk said it's a way in which to immunize where the, um, the person doesn't experience infection. You can't. The virus is dead. So there's two approaches, right? The attenuated approach and the sort of killed path pathogen approach, if you will. Because our body's immune system, if it knows what it's doing, will go and launch antibodies at things. And once those antibodies, if, if our bodies know what these foreign invaders are and they mark them with antibodies, that's it. The white blood cells just come along, see those antibodies, and they lay in and attack those pathogens and take them right out. Our bodies are wondrous things. They destroy cancer cells every day. They destroy viruses every day. They destroy bacteria every day. It's all good. That's why you need to get your sleep. You don't want to get too stressed out. Now, we do have these things called antibiotics. And antibiotics are, is an interesting term. So I'm going to zoom in on it. What it means, it's sort of a two-part word. And it means anti means against. And bio, well, it means against life. It's like, what a weird cryptic word. Now, if I zoom out again, pop out. Antibiotics, uh, Alexander Fleming, what he discovered was when he was working in his lab, uh, Alexander Fleming is, is famous for discovering penicillin. There we go. Quick Google search will bring this up. He discovered that when he was working with, uh, basically with uh, some laboratory, oops, not it, videos. Shoot, I need images. He was working in the lab and he discovered, this is a good example of it, he discovered that uh, he was, he was sort of doing some uh, medical plating, if you will, and he got a fungus growing up on on his uh, on his agar plates. And what happened? Agar is basically like a seaweed jello, and he noticed, strangely enough, that the fungus was producing something that was keeping those bacteria from growing anywhere nearby. And this was a, this was actually an accident. It didn't intend for this to happen, and it led to a hypothesis that he had that. Well, okay, the fungus must be producing something, something that's inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. What was it? Well, this is this is a penicillin. Okay, penicillin's named after the fungus. So penicillium is is the fungus that we'll call it the genus. And it's this that led to uh, Fleming's discovery of antibiotics. And since then we've discovered many and we keep coming up with new varieties and we keep testing them like this. Uh, we did some lab work. Uh, let's see here. Oops. We did some lab work with these to see what really is most effective. I just got to go back one. There we go. This is what I wanted to show. And the larger the zone, the clear zone around that little pad, the more effective the antibiotic is. By today's standards, most bacteria have gotten used to penicillin, and it really doesn't have much of an effect. But we have some, we have some uh, synthetics and de derived versions that we've made. But what was biggest about this, and I saw the picture just a moment ago, so bear with me. Ha! Is on the battlefield, 
we were able to introduce antibiotics so that when, for example, soldiers experienced uh, injuries from shrapnel, that they we could treat things like gangrene and we didn't have to cut off people's limbs and we could stem infections before they became a huge problem. So Alexander Fleming uh, and his discoveries of, of penicillin, there's your nice little uh, molecule down there if you want to do a little organic chemistry, it revolutionized medicine. But what we've learned from Darwin is that if we overuse something like penicillin, that all we're doing is selecting the bacteria that have the ability through mutation, sort, sort of, uh, well, the bacteria constantly going through mutation. And some bacteria through mutation have found the, the right genetic sequence to be able to survive penicillin. They're the lucky mutants that, for them, penicillin isn't really a uh, problem. For them, it's, it's even a food source. So you don't want to use an antibiotic too much because it, after a while it won't work. The bacteria become immune to it, right? The weak bacteria die and the strong bacteria that can handle it survive. You're just artificially selecting them. And in a similar way, you'll notice this, it's killing bacteria here. The penicillin and most antibiotics, they don't work on viruses. There are some compounds like acyclovir, um, there are antiviral agents, but we just don't have as many um, tools in our tool chest of drugs to go after viruses. Not like we do with antibiotics, but we have to be careful because it's sort of a never ending battle. They're getting ahead of us. So we've increased human life expectancy with all these neat things we've been able to do. All these drugs, etc., that we've been able to, to harness to keep ourselves healthier. So how do you control bacterial growth? Well, sterilization is is one thing that you can do. Uh, sterilization, uh, well, first one that comes to mind, you can use heat, right? You can use steam. So if you want to sterilize water, heat, steam, you get the idea, boil, This is when you literally just destroy using energy, anything that could be living inside of a sample. Um, sterilization, uh, steam mops, things like that. Steam, steam burns them and it just, it just vaporizes the water in them and they just basically burst. Disinfectants, when we get to that, we're talking about chemicals. So that's where your Lysol and your toothpaste and things like that come into play, right? Uh, polysporin that you rub on a cut and we will look at food processing so basically cooling so your refrigerator right another thing that you can do when you can preserves okay by that I'm talking about jam things like that we use a tremendous amount of sugar in, in canning things to the point where it's so sugary or, well, or it's so salty that nothing can live in that. Um, they used to salt pork so that the bacteria, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't live in that salty meat. The meat was so salty that they would just become dehydrated and die. So this is largely what this is, is a dehydration strategy that'll kill the bacteria. You can dehydrate them with salt or with sugar. Um, look at honey. If anything, honey lasts forever, it really does. Anything that's foolish enough to try to live in honey will die a horrible death of dehydration as all the water in its body is pulled out into that concentrated syrupy honey. It's, it's basically death by osmosis. The water flows out of you into honey. sterilization by heat so most bacteria can't handle this you just cook them until they're basically dead pretty easy concept now we'll, I'm gonna jump out here in a second because we use heat to sterilize our food you get that but some of our food products they can't exactly be they can't exactly be cooked uh, for too long if we look at pasteurization Sure, you're using heat. Now, pasteurization, um, you might best know it 
uh, with milk, although it also is, is used with beverages like beer. Pasteurization. In this case, it's the use of heat, but we don't use it, we we don't use heat, for example, like uh, all the way up to boiling. We pasteurize milk with about sixty degrees Celsius temperatures, and you say, "Well, wait a minute, sixty degrees Celsius is that's not enough. Sixty C, that's not going to kill all the germs." Here's the interesting thing: we if if you don't use you have to use 60 degrees celsius with milk anything higher will sort of cook the protein in milk and it'll burn it if you've ever heated up milk on a burner at home you'll know it's pretty easy uh, to burn and when i was a kid we used to make this thing called milk toast i know it sounds crazy but i learned you can't put milk in a in, basically in a pot and turn it up to hot because it just burns right on the bottom so I'm going to just pop out a reflect, and I'll show you this neat little animation on, on how that pasteurization process occurs. Pasteurization is extremely useful. In fact, there's a cold version that we use with sashimi. So here we go. Dairy farming. So you got to watch out because cow milk itself can be infected. There's all sorts of nasty things, including uh, tuberculosis can get in there. You can't serve... Um, you shouldn't serve, I'm going to be more correct in my statement, you shouldn't serve raw milk unless you're certain that it's basically been sort of sterilized to a certain extent. Maybe there's some germs on the cow's udder. So this is an automatic sort of milking machine. And, you know, you think it's it's clean, you know. Uh, we've got to keep the human hands off of it. But, you know, we do our best. By the way, if you've ever milked a cow, it's pretty. it's a pretty rough process. I've done it. It's you're going to get strong hands doing that if you keep it up. So the the milk will flow through the pipes and initially they'll sort of chill it to, to preserve it. But they'll check it over and they'll test it uh, to make sure that if there's anti antibiotics in the milk and that, that might sound weird but there's some antibiotics in, in the feed. So they test, they test, they test. And the pasteurization process, this is what I want to get to, sort of these large vats. And they heat up the milk, so they cycle the temperature sort of up and down and up and down and up and down. It's, it's sort of a yo-yo of temperature. And it eventually kills any harmful microorganisms like tuberculosis that just might get in there. And then the milk is, is sort of mixed up, homogenized, and this is just extra information about the dairy process. But um, I've had... I've had raw milk uh, on the ranch, and it, it tastes it tastes very different. But you got to understand, you take a you take a a risk every time you consume uh, raw milk because there might be something in there that you had overlooked. And really, the beverage industry can't be responsible for that. You can't have unprocessed milk and serve it to the population. It's just it's just a no no, right? And plus, well, anybody gets sick, and you got to realize you could get sued. Not good. So pasteurization process with milk. Now there is freeze pasteurizing. If you think about um, sashimi, right? Sashimi is uh, the, the two kinds that I really like it. There's two kinds of sashimi. There's salmon, uh, with, well not two kinds, there's many kinds, but the two I'm going to refer to are salmon and tuna. Now that's really good, but what about little germs or, or little parasites or something infected uh, that gets in your, that causes infection that gets into your food? Well, you can do something which is kind of the other extreme where you can take the meat and you can freeze it. And if you have a slab of meat, let's say this is the meat, and you freeze it, you can form zoom out here little ice crystals and they're like little daggers so I'll draw almost like a shirk in here and those ice crystals will destroy the cells of anything they form in so the cells in there they just pop and the cells of the pathogens will pop too so if you freeze in this case I'll just cross this out now and we'll say for example if let's say we were doing freezing You've got to get the you've got to get the meat down really cold. Like we're talking past minus twenty degrees. 
and I'm just being paranoid to be safe, minus 25, and you make it a solid block of ice, and that those ice crystals just form, and they destroy anything they form in. So, look, if you're going, you don't go and make your own sashimi. You go and buy sashimi-grade meat, and you go to the market, and you get the proper advice, and if you're going to have sashimi, which is raw fish, you go see the right people and say, I need sashimi-grade meat, and this is how they prepare it. It's frozen like a block of ice. Not much would survive that. It's not a good way to preserve humans either. Um, the, probably, when you, if you've heard of um, cryogenics, you would be frozen in a way where your tissues would be more like a more like a Slurpee, right? In a Slurpee, the ice is soft; it never forms those big nasty crystals, so that your cells wouldn't pop, right? That'd be the right way to to freeze you. I guess like Philip J. Fry from Futurama, if you've ever seen that. Disinfectants, we'll get rolling here, are chemical solutions. So the ones that we tested in the lab we, we, uh, that are really effective, I mean, our bleach, which is better known as sodium hypochlorite. There will be a test on that Monday. Um, bleach 10% and above just kills them dead, and that's what we discovered. 15%, it just literally your plates will have giant clear spots and there will be no left no leftover bacteria not around those little sort of pads um, you can use bleach there's things like like Lysol we saw that rubbing alcohol and alcohol in general uh, is very nasty on them right rubbing alcohol these all really do a good job in killing them and if you notice at schools what do they use that's cheap works every time well, hey, a 15% bleach solution in a bucket with a with a mop, spread it around. Not much is going to live on the uh, gym floor, much less in the uh, change rooms. So food storage, uh, I sort of already talked about this. Let's get away from that color there. Refrigerated food, it just that just slows them down. Okay, we slow down their metabolic rate, and poor little guys, they can't multiply as fast. It gives us a chance to stay one step ahead of them, right? Why do we cook our food? Well, we cook our food to kill all the little parasites in it. We also discovered along the way that it sort of made it taste better. So when you boil and fry and steam, uh, you've, you've sterilized your food or somewhat sterilized your food for a while, okay? But you've got to watch out because the bacteria will come rushing back in. Uh, you put it even if you leave it in the fridge you can't leave it in the fridge forever um, i cleaned out my cousin's fridge and i couldn't believe that cranberries could grow mold but you know what even as acidic as cranberry juice is hey if it's been in the fridge six months <laughs> something will find a way to live in it there are viral diseases in humans right hiv we've already talked about influenza the common cold yeah and they disrupt our equilibrium, so we get these great things like fevers, right? We get vomiting and, well, think of it as vomiting from both ends. Vomiting from the southern end, we refer to as diarrhea. That's a massive loss of water. That's not good. That'll definitely throw out your equilibrium. Uh, the body's natural tendency towards a fever is a fever is... Tr it's trying to make your tissues um, a little bit more accessible. Tissues become a little bit leaky. And just think of it this way. The tissues become a little bit more fluid. And what's trying to happen there is we're trying to let the white blood cells, specifically the macrophages, get in. They, they get better access and the body increases its own temperature just to let the more white blood cells into your tissues to go after the germs. Unfortunately, a fever can get out of hand um, as soon as you start going past 102, 103 degrees. Uh, if you've ever had little kids, right, at about 101 degrees Fahrenheit, I've noticed my kids always barf. That's it. That's a barf temperature. So in one respect, you want to let the fever develop a little bit, but once it starts to get kind of over 100, 101, yeah, and um, seizures can happen, and that can lead to, lead to death, obviously, when the temperatures hit like you know 103 104 and heaven forbid 105 that that's when it gets really really nasty 
viruses, well, they attack and destroy cells, and they, in a similar way, we saw that the T4 bacteriophage will will cause clear spots on a plate because it's busy killing E. coli, right? And viruses, we saw that they can go this nasty phase called lytic, which is when literally cells start popping, right? And think about a cold sore, right? That's a full-blown lytic episode for your lip cells, okay? It, it's pretty nasty. Some viruses can even turn on forms of cancer. And that can happen when the virus inserts near a cancer gene in your genetic code. And it's one of the reasons why we immunize or suggest immunization for females. Uh, there is a vaccine uh, against cervical cancer. And what we're doing is we're trying to eliminate a virus that sort of activates the oncogenes, the cancer genes. And that vaccine is very, very important because if we can keep females from being infected by the virus that what are, are sort of the strongest most active hypothesis with the best data says we can by stopping the virus make sure that to a certain extent it's the best chance that we have that those genes aren't turned on so we're preventing cancer cervical cancer not a hundred percent but we're we're doing a lot better than if we hadn't done anything otherwise so vaccines just lit they they're working with the premise that let's activate human defense let's get the human immune system mobilized let's educate it and by educating it let's say you, you get the flu shot every year because uh, influenza is an rna virus and the RNA single-stranded genome, it mutates heavily. And when it mutates, the critter is going to look different every year. So they have to come up with a vaccine every year. If you do that, well, you've given yourself a fighting chance. Look, most viruses, you cannot take antibiotics, okay? I shouldn't say most viruses. Antibiotics... In a general sense, if you think about the penicillins, etc., they don't work. They're only meant to go after bacteria. They go after the bacterial cell wall, for example, or we try to poison the uh, ribosomes of the bacteria. We try to make it so they can't produce um, proteins, and we kill them that way. Uh, things like tetracycline do that. But most antibiotics, they don't work against viruses. Right? A lot of them don't. As I said, we don't have a good arsenal we, to stop the outbreak of, of viruses. We're getting, as, as medicine progresses, we're finding things that are, that are starting to work, right? AZT is a compound that helps to reduce outbreaks of infection of HIV. And if there's fewer outbreaks, fewer cells are infected, get the idea. So here's some of our m more common viruses. Please notice that the common cold, one thing that you don't see um, with a common cold is you don't really get a, you don't really get a, you might have a slightly elevated fever, but it won't be super high. And you won't have, you might have a little bit of body aching, but you won't have that incredible body ache. If you've ever had influenza, you go flat on your back and you go through the chills and your body aches all over and you just... You know, it feels like you've been run over by a truck. The common cold isn't like that. Influenza is. Let's see if I can get my highlighter back. There we go. Um, oh, yeah, it's not going to highlight because this is considered to be a picture. So influenza, right? Pretty nasty. The common cold, you really shouldn't have those kind of symptoms. It's sort of a, I guess you could call it influenza light, you know, um, you know, you blow in your nose all the time. You, slight fever. You, maybe you're about 98, 99 degrees max. The other diseases, that you, there's a lot you could say and you could go on and on. The chicken pox, a lot of us have had that. There's a vaccine to that now. So you want to get the vaccine. 
Because if you don't, later on in life, the revenge of the chicken pox is, well, give yourself, think about this for a second. Maybe your aunt or uncle, maybe older brother or sister got it, right? It's called shingles. And um, it's pretty nasty. Let's pop out just for a sec. It is a biology class. Shingles, you'll get uh, the sort of stripy rash. And uh, shingles can be very, very painful. There you go. And that will just ache, right? If you think about just how much it aches if you get um, a cold sore, imagine that along your side, okay? You can prevent that because if you get the chicken pox vaccine in the first place, if you don't get the chicken pox, then you don't get this dormant form that can sort of lie within the skin and wait to come back later as the revenge of the chicken pox we know is shingles. And we've got some others. We've got West Nile virus, right, which is spread... Um, uh, especially being from Canada, it, one of its vectors or means of transmission are mosquitoes, right? Hepatitis. Hepatitis uh, causes an inflammation of the liver, and you'll get uh, jaundice, which is yellowing. Um, so you can have, you'll see it with like yellow eyes, and the skin becomes more yellow, and you get this abdominal pain and vomiting, and and hepatitis you can get through. Um, well, if you can use, unfortunately, let's say if you go travel abroad, you use a set of, you use somebody's fingernail clippers or you uh, go walking on the beach. Subtle ways like that, you, if you get cut, you can actually get hepatitis. You can get it from um, drinking um, infected uh, or contaminated water, let's say. So hepatitis, there's a couple different versions. Um, but largely, it causes an inflammation of the liver, an infection, uh, and you'll feel all the symptoms that are sort of outlined here. And we could go, I could go on and on about this, but it's quite a bit. There are viruses that infect plants. In fact, uh, we showed you one a little while ago. It was known as the tobacco mosaic virus. There we go. The tobacco mosaic virus images causes some pretty nasty damage to uh, tobacco plants. And that's obviously an economic crop and it's caused by these little bacteria. We've seen this in a previous uh, sort of slideshow. They're arranged like this. If you want to get right down to it, their genome, little RNA single-sided genome, that's really all it is. They're little sort of surface proteins and once they infect pl these tobacco plants, they cause this mondo damage that you see here. Now viroids and prions, I'm, I'm just going to talk about uh, prions because they, oops, pardon me, because they cause disease in animals and I've got a really neat presentation. Viroids are the, are the equivalent in plants and prions are the ones that are going to affect animals so I'm obviously I'm going to go into that a little bit more but please understand that these are essentially sort of renegade uh, self-replicating proteins. They don't even have genetic material. They don't have nucleic acids. They don't have DNA. They don't have RNA. Renegade, oops, renegade proteins. And if they replicate, these proteins can cause damage. They can build up and in, in, in regions where if you, even if your body removes them, they create sort of tears and imagine unfortunately if that gets into your central nervous system brain or spinal cord that's not good because they'll cause lesions or tears and that can lead to things like mad cow disease right and in the human the human form is known as Kreutz, uh, Kreutzfeldt Jacobs disease if you consume um, animal flesh that has these prions, these little self-replicating proteins, they can get into us and if they get into our bloodstream, make their way to the brain, then what we have are these horrible little proteins that will do a number on us as well. So, um, jump out for a second, turn off mirroring, and let's see here. 
there's a little video here on on how prions arise so what we've got there we go oh, I don't want to zoom in too much um, is a neuron and so let's that's basically a nerve cell and what's going to happen uh, in this case we're going to look at humans but it's the human form of mad cow disease where these renegade proteins replicate and well hold on I'll show you the rest there is evidence that the infectious agent associated with certain brain diseases such as creutzfeldt jakob disease in humans and mad cow disease in animals may be caused by a protein the infectious agent has been called a prion for protonaceous infectious particle okay so let's get past this and i'll give you the, the tour these little purple things here are basically um, renegade little proteins and they build up on the neurons this is specifically called the dendrite end of your neuron as they build up they can replicate so these neat these interesting little ribbons are just a close-up of that and as they they replicate they can convince proteins around them to become like them so it's sort of like zombie protein manufacturing and what will happen is you'll get the creation of sort of more sort of abdu these weird proteins that aren't folded the right way um, and you'll get these prions and uh, what you saw there right um, the prions can make other prions and that can be a really nasty um, replicating process there you go now if you get the buildup of these things around the neural tissue if you get too many the body will clear them away but when it clears them away it literally sort of tears them out of place and leaves behind horrible lesions and holes where they were and you can see that they're going all over the place so in grade 12 we talk about this a little bit more but just suffice it to say those proteins create tears in your nervous tissue and you can imagine that tears in the nervous tissue uh, mad cow disease is called mad cow disease for a reason Th these animals can't get up they can't stand their nervous system is is bonkers and it's it's a horrible thing to see if this happens uh, what the uh, cattle will be isolated you have to make sure they didn't get it from the feed they can't be exposed to other cattle um, you, and if it happens it's happened in Canada and our exports to the United States have just been stopped because they don't know which cattle are infected until they know everything about the infection cycle it can have huge economic consequences huge because imagine if you're a cattle farmer and exports just stop well what happens well try to earn a living you, you it's pretty hard unless you're a big business you can go out of business right away and um, what was really the problem in the cattle industry for quite a while is is there was a little bit of um, how shall we put this infected protein getting into the feed and um, if some of the animals recycled into cattle feed well imagine if some of the animal that was recycled into the cattle feed had was infected with these prions and it's a it's a horrible cycle so the cattle feed has to be pure it can't have what they've done now is gotten any sort of traces of, of cattle out of the feed right they don't mix the cattle protein in with the feed uh, that basically has to be stopped it's not a good thing so I'll finish up here I've had the time to sort of go into this and, and give you sort of my uh, generalistic impressions on disease diseases that are caused I did mention that, that there is a tremendous tremendous amount of material in your book to take you further on this because there are viroids but at this point I'll just stop okay because really for the purpose of the BC curriculum we're gonna stop at viroids and prions we don't really need to go all the way into well these are renegade proteins what about renegade genetic material what if it was just genetic material if you want to if you're interested in this and you want to keep going uh, you can go into all the material and more go ahead and read forward but I will stop here okay ladies and gentlemen thanks for listening and have a good one signing off <laughs>